Greetings, this is September 7th at 5 a.m. and there's been minimal activity in the fire perimeter and no real perceivable expansion. We'll take a look at a couple of hot spots. These screens were captured at 4 a.m. Pacific Standard Time and they're showing data up till 11.30 p.m. September 6th and the closest infrared hotspots indicated are approximately two kilometers northwest of Watch Lake and that came in at 11.30 p.m. yesterday. And we've got another new hotspot that came in at the same time to the north of Tin Cup Lake. And I am noticing there is a 12-hour hotspot to the northwest of Tin Cup Lake and this appears connected to a larger grouping that was part of a controlled burn earlier. So let's continue with the presentation as it was prepared before this check. We are looking west on Dry BC Sheridan Cam towards 93 Mile Lone Butte area. There is a lot of haze and if you look to the lower right of your screen there was a creature there. We're going to go to the NRC data. This is displaying for 6.39 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and we're looking for fringe infrared hotspots that are outside this graphic perimeter that was generated by their computer model. We're looking for anything that wants to break out and I am seeing some outlying hotspots but there's nothing new in the six hour category. Please remember when we're looking at this data it may be obscured by smoke clouds and it may be off position by as much as 500 meters to a kilometer so I have to combine the data that I'm seeing with reports that I've heard from the ground from uh, BC Wildfire and their program to do control burning in the areas. So one of the things I do is compare with other data available and one of those sources is NASA's Earth data. They have all the streams of numbers that are coming from the satellite with the longitude and latitude and the global position and the fuel type and the temperature and all we have to do is just scroll down the screen, click on KML, hit uh, under Canada the ML that we want to automatically load into Google Earth and bang we are looking at it so it makes it really easy and the link will be below. Now we're looking at the Elephant Hill wildfire the active areas shown within the last 24 hours and I clicked on a couple of hot spots it's coming in from around 4 p.m. and as I've said in previous videos I'm not a big fan of the little fire icon I'd prefer something that was easier to calibrate such as the squares with a central dot and it shows me the range of variance but we'll take it because it works just zoom right in uh, we're looking south of Green Lake. This is around the Hutchison area. It's not showing any infrared there right now. That could be obscured by smoke or cloud. But I am going to click on uh, whichever hotspot is closest to a lake or a landmark. And I'll just pick the furthest one south here. It came up at 2018 UTC. Uh, just subtract 7 hours and that makes it about 1, 118. If we move further north, we're looking at the Mount Jim area north of Tin Cup Lake. And the outside marker on that was about the same, 1.30 in the afternoon. And that is the furthest west that this system perceived infrared at that time. We've zoomed out now and just taking an overview of the northern flank and seeing where different concentrations are if I can see that line of fire guard that might be building along the ray field going north toward Sheridan Lake and if we zoom in to Sheridan Lake and I'll look at the furthest eastward hot spot and click on it if we subtract 7 we get 1454 so approximately minutes before 3 o'clock in the afternoon if we move over to Watch Lake, we're moving further west. That's uh, just south of Jack Frost Lake. And if we're looking at the furthest westward spot here towards Watch Lake, it came in at approximately 3.30 in the morning of September 6. And that's uh, approximately two kilometers east of the lake. We've moved southward to Young Lake now and I'm looking at the furthest east spot towards the lake and that comes in just before 3 o'clock in the afternoon of September 6th. So 
This gives us an idea of when this activity was occurring. Moving further south again, all the way to High Heum, south of southeast of Loon Lake, the infrared displayed here looks virtually unchanged from the last update, and uh, until we get a clearer day when there's not so much smoke and haze obscuring, I'm going to have to come back and recheck this area. We'll just move on. We're looking at Cathedral Lakes, and quite intense. You can see this activity being pushed to the northwest into Canada across the border. We're seeing those fringe hot spots as the fire reaches out for new fuel. If we zoom in, we are looking at approximately 1.12 in the afternoon and I'm seeing a lot of patterning here so there may be some control strategy going on and we could test individual hot spots and see if they kind of all came in at the same time or within close range. Let's move over to Peachland and we're seeing only six hot spots so I'm going to make an assumption that it is being obscured there's probably a lot of smoke coming off there. This is where you want visual confirmation on the ground. And the closest hotspot to Okanagan Lake came in at the same time, 1.12. And now let's take a look at one more fire with this system. Uh, this is on the Blue Joint Mountain in the Christian Valley. We're looking towards Upper Arrow Lake. And I'm going to make an assumption that these hot spots are spreading out from a central area. They're burning towards the fringes and we've got very rugged treacherous terrain there. And if I look at the hot spot that's highest in elevation going up the mountainside, it's reading 2154. So that puts it just a few minutes before three o'clock in the afternoon. So this system is a valuable tool. It allows us to isolate Canada and examine areas of our concern. And if you have access to Google Earth, you might consider loading it up and just taking a look at more detailed aspects of specific fires. Let's jump over to Windy now. And as you can see, wind speeds have dropped. Uh, they're about half the velocity they were this afternoon, four kilometers an hour uh, around Pressy Lake. And there's greater speed on the outside edges of this trough that's heading northwards towards Williams Lake. The wind is coming from generally the south-southeast, but it's going to vary direction depending on where you are. Here we're looking at almost south, uh, coming at three kilometers an hour around Cache Creek. And these speeds are actually slower than what's being shown in the forecast. So it could go up to eight, nine kilometers an hour overnight. It's going to consistently come from the southeast. It could increase in velocity to 13, maybe 15 kilometers an hour in the afternoon. And then on Friday, uh, there's going to be a mix up. Different wind conditions depending on where this rain is occurring and how much we get. I'd like to quickly show you another application I found uh, in a search for VIIRS data. I came upon this Raytheon application. It was on Google Play and you can take a look at the globe and adjust uh, some very simplified controls. Look at the night sky, uh, vegetation, and different atmospheric conditions. Here we're looking at the province of British Columbia and the lights being emitted during the evening and it's kind of updated in real time. It gets the latest satellite information. It doesn't allow us to zoom in close enough to do fire spotting or look at hot spots with it, but it might be valuable if you want to kind of look at smoke or where atmospheric conditions are occurring and it kind of complements the windy program. So it's another tool in the toolbox. So let's go back to Windy now and I'd like to take a look at Hurricane Irma and this is a unique view. We're actually looking at the waves and you may not be able to see it on this screen. They're very fine but we're seeing these horizontal or diagonal lines and they're moving in a direction towards the Florida coast. That's giving us an indication of where the, the largest swells or the wave activity is. Now we're switching over to the rain and what precipitation is falling in the area. 
the brighter colored bands will have the most intense activities. So we've zoomed in and I've measured across the diameter of this dark red and purple ring. Approximately 160 kilometers is this circular swath of rain. And when we look at the eye in the wind model, we can also zoom in and it's approximately 28 kilometers across. And that's right where the greatest wind velocities would be. I tried taking a measurement looking for this uh, 180 miles per hour. It's very difficult to isolate that band and I was able to discover some around 133 kilometers an hour. According to reports, the hurricane should reach 180 to 200 miles per hour. That's, uh, I believe, around 250 kilometers an hour. And this will be a historic event. I can only hope that they've had enough time to prepare. They're in much the similar situation as the people here in BC. They have to verify their position, they have to know their escape routes, and they have to have all their resources ahead of time. It's just a philosophy of surviving in natural disasters and we are now well experienced in that so please everyone check the official alerts and bulletins below and be safe thank you for watching